Welcome to the Heartbreak to Happiness Show with Sara Davison. If you're struggling with a breakup and you feel shocked, angry, betrayed, devastated, or sad and alone, then this podcast is for you. Best selling author and award winning host Sara Davison shares how you too can get on with your life to heal, grow, and move from heartbreak to happiness. Here's your host, Sara Davison. Welcome back to the show. And today, my guest is Carol Mack. Carol is the author of The Gift of the Ladybug. She's an executive producer and the host at wineforfood.com. And her story of overcoming the loss of her child through food bliss is one you will want to hear. So I am super excited to welcome Carol Mack to the show. Welcome, Carol. Ah, oh, thank you so much for having me. I loved our conversation a couple of months ago in New York City so much, and I am just so honored to be on your show. Wow, well, I'm super honored that you're here because your story is so moving and so powerful and such a positive transformation story for most of us, we don't know how that is even possible. So yeah, I know you're gonna inspire so many of my listeners and there's gonna be so much good information. So everyone listening, listen up, get your pens ready, take notes and notes, because Carol's got some amazing wisdom to share. So Carol, let's start if we can at the beginning with your story about how you got into to doing the work you do today. Sure. Um... So my story really all relates back to my son, TJ. So about 12 years ago, I was pregnant and I was in Ohio and I was doing real estate and I was, and I was watching the Food Network. And I was like, that's weird. I feel like that's my future, huh? And I didn't really think anything of it. I was like, because that's like not my world right now. I had done food in Chicago previously, but I was on a different path in real estate. And end up having this beautiful baby boy and uh, we think he's perfectly healthy and, and amazing. And, um, and then we end up finding out that he has a lot of issues and eventually we find out that he is terminal. So mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing where like my whole life just stopped. Right. And um, I did not know how I could possibly live through losing him. And the coolest thing about TJ, my son, TJ, was that he taught me how to live. Like he was literally the most peaceful, wise, like human I've ever known, even though as a child, baby. Right. And he, through his eyes and demeanor, when I would hold him, it's like, he knew he was, he, he knew he was, had this terminal illness, but he also knew he was okay. And so he would laugh and, and have joy and be in the present moment. Like he would feel pain, but he did not have fear. Like there was no going back to the doctor and being like, oh, I can't have another shot. He was just absolutely perfectly present and powerful in the way he lived. He lived outside of his circumstance of illness. And so I watched that and I promised myself after he passes away, I will do my best to live powerfully outside of my circumstances. Like like he's taught me how to do. I think that's the, the best way to honor him. And I've done everything in my power to do that. And wow. hopefully we can help. Yeah. I mean, that I mean, is such a moving story. I think, you know, I'm a mother and that, you know, obviously is I think the greatest pain anyone can ever go through is that is, is to lose your child. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's so tough to hear the story, but it, I, I hear what you're saying and how you want to live outside of your circumstances and that, and that TJ did that. And that's incredible. So explain a bit more about what you mean by that, because obviously the, you know, it was tough for him as a baby. It was, it was painful, but you saying that he lived as if, you know, it was, he, he wasn't going through that. Yeah, it was, it was just how he lived. It was like what he embodied on a day-to-day -day life like minute to minute thing as in he felt pain so say we would have to go and get shots that day or a surgery you know he would cry with pain like eh, wow and then but as soon as he like came back into normal he would be like loving and happy and joyful and laughing like i can remember a picture where he had like 27 electrodes and they weren't this part wasn't painful but it was like really uncomfortable because he was getting all these tests 
And he just had this like wide open, happiest laughing. He had us all cracking up in the hospital Mm -hmm. room. And so he showed me, and it was like, I'd be like, TJ, I I talked to him kind of like an adult, like TJ, this is your journey. I want your quality of life is paramount. This isn't about me. Like, do you want this surgery? And I would just sense like, he'd be like, yes, you know, but, and it wasn't like he was oblivious to any of this. He's like, yeah, this, this sucks. And mama, you can do this too. It was almost like, we can do this. It's not gonna be fun, but we can do this. And then once the pain is gone, I can laugh and be joyful. And it was like, he Mm -hmm. lived in this joyful, like live joyfully and peacefully. And then when the pain hit, he was in the pain, but that he lived up here. Right. Mm -hmm. And so his every, his constant was presence, power, peace, and joy. And then when the pain came, he just, he was fully in the pain and then came right out of it. I was like, wait, that's possible. Cause I would just be in pain the whole time knowing that something else was coming. Yeah. And now I know that you don't have to live like that you don't, it's like, that's the difference between pain and suffering, right? Pain is the physical thing that happens to you. Suffering is what you think about the pain and how much you create your own suffering around what that means. And so he didn't suffer. He only felt pain, but no fear and no suffering. And I just didn't even know that was possible for a human being. No. Well, I mean, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And to learn that, I mean, he was so young, wasn't he? When when was he diagnosed and and when did he pass? He was diagnosed at around six months and he passed at 14 months. Wow. Wow. I mean, and how you were, you were, you were married um, at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you cope with that? Because I know a lot of people who follow me, who listen to me, you know, they, you know, children with illnesses does put a lot of pressure understandably because of the torment that you're going through um how did how did that how did you guys cope with the diagnosis and then during that that time yeah you know I have to say we were an amazing team at that stage um we really came together and it was all about TJ's quality of life and supporting each other I can remember like every time a certain beautiful boy by John Lennon would come on our, our playlist throughout the house. We'd come down and dance together. And we would just, we were rocks for each other. We were able to transcend the pain and not take it out on each other. But we went to counseling and stuff after he died. And our grief counselor said that if you like 92% of people that go through a loss of a child don't make it of couples. And I was like, that's not gonna be me. Oh no. I'm like madly in love. No, no, no. You know, been married 10 years at this point or whatever. And he said it's like a magnet and basically when you lose a child and they first go it's like a magnet and you're like whoop to your partner because that partner reminds you of everything that you like long for and miss with every ounce of your being but as you heal it's like it's like the repellent magnet it's like you turn it and it repels because um you are really just it's so painful that memory and your partner like my partner has tj's eyebrows so like that kind of thing. And you can just, it, it just reminds you it's too close. And even from like a biological thing, like if, if the two of you together creates someone with a terminal illness, it's like almost biology is trying to be like, okay, go find new partners. And he said, it's basically like fighting chemistry and biology. It's almost no one can do it. And so we ended up parting with really so much love and so much um, amicability. Is that a word? Well, I love it. We'll take it. We'll, <laughs> we'll make it, it a word. Sure. Now it is. <laughs> um, and because we just realized that we weren't able to, to heal together. And so it was basically after, after a lot of subsequent losses, loss of TJ, loss of brother-in-law, it was just, it was too much pain and we needed to, uh, heal separately. And that's why. Yeah. Cause you went through the loss of your brother-in-law during that grieving period, didn't you? Yeah. So it was like one big blow and then another big blow. And it was like, eventually it was too many big blows. Um, there were some financial blows and some career blows and cancer within the family. It was just a lot. And so it was like, I guess, I guess to heal and tend to live our best lives, I guess we're going to have to do it separately. Mm. That's really really interesting. Um, that the counselor told you that information. I haven't heard that before that there's actually you know, the, the magnet, and it makes a lot of sense, I guess it does, does make a lot of sense. Um, but it, it's incredibly sad, because obviously, you've gone through that journey, but it's great that you guys managed to stay amicable. Um, and, and because divorce is tough, as a lot of people listening will know. Yeah. So 
I mean, I, personally, I think the loss of the child has to be the most painful thing. And I know that, you know, the, the loss cycle that we go through after a breakup is, is second to the trauma of going through loss of a loved one. Um, we follow the same patterns. It's really interesting yeah. that there's, the, there's the, the loss cycle, they're going through the denial, then the anger, then the bargaining stage and the depression and then coming out to acceptance. That's the roller coaster of a breakup. I mean, I can't even begin or not, I wouldn't want to obviously just even to comment on how bad it could be, but I just, it's probably my greatest fear as a parent. And to see you today, Carol, I mean, you know, for anyone watching on YouTube, Carol is beautiful. She's glowing. She's got a sparkle in her eye. Her energy is high. You know, she's beaming and you can feel that. I mean, how is that possible? Because I'm looking at you thinking, I don't know that I could do that. So please share with us, what is it that you've done and, and your tips for, for my listeners? Sure. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you. That was, that was so sweet. You know, it, it's been a road, right? I'm not going to say it's been easy. It's been hard. <laughs> like, I don't know if I could say that on your show. <laughs> it's been rough. And um, I feel like, you know, I didn't know that we could experience so much pain as humans. I, I couldn't have even conceived of how painful that was. It was a million times more than I could have possibly thought of. And I was a million plus infinity times more strong through it, resilient through it that I could have ever imagined as well. So, and the pain is temporary, even though the circumstance is not temporary in this lifetime. Like, I think one of the hardest things for me is TJ was always going to be dead. So how would I, sorry to use that word, but like he was always going to be gone. So how am I ever going to feel better? It's yeah. an internship, right? It's, it's taking your power back in your life. And it's same thing after divorce, right? So this external circumstance that happened to you, you may have not had any control. Maybe there was a cheating situation or, and you have zero control and you just feel lost and powerless completely in your life. There's a way to reframe it in your, in your mind to, to tell a story that serves you. And there's a way to get out all of the emotion over time. There's like practices that I'll do. I'll tell you one right now and then add in joy. So I think reframing is one huge thing. How do you tell a story within your circumstances that doesn't change it? Like you can't change, TJ couldn't change you as terminal. I can't change, I lost a kid. You guys can't change, you had a divorce. But what we can do is we change how we look on it, at it and how we can take power back in our lives and still build a life we love despite circumstances we hate. Mm. Um, and then so and then get rid of it. And then so in the minutia of it, like when you're miserable and you're in a ball on the floor, bawling your head off. Right. I think the best thing to do, it's called I've named it called art of acceptance. A R T A is allow. Um, R is release and T is trust. So when you're in a ball, just allow. I think a big thing I would do is like, I was a gymnast my whole life. You're not allowed to feel that. You're not allowed to be scared. You're not allowed to be hungry. You're not. And I'd be like, ooh, I can't feel that disgusting feeling, right? But what I learned is no, no. invite it in. Hi, it's okay. It's okay. You, you know, high anxiety, high fear, high trauma, high sadness, high devastation. It's okay that you're here. I'm going to allow you in because, and I'm going to look at you and I'm going to welcome you in. And then I'm going to just be with you. And then I'm going to release you out. So it's like, allow it in the shit, the shittiest of shit, but then you got to get it out. And so find ways I found to get it out was I got a punching bag. One of my friends who lost her mom was like, get a punching bag and put it in your basement or go to the gym and punch it out or sprint or scream into a pillow or journal it out or talk with your friends or ball until you get, like get out the emotions and then name it. Like, what am I most sad about right now? Eh, and ball it out or scream it out. And then sometimes you're so exhausted, but I swear to God, it'll take that poison and it gets it out of your body forever. At little by little, as each emotion comes, allow it, release it, and then trust that you have what it takes to feel good again. I promise. Even if you can't see it right now and trust that you, you can do this. Like you can do it. Trust yourself. Love you that. I think it's such good advice. And I think quite often we do bottle up those emotions. And I love that. It's like punching a, a punch bag or a pillow or just screaming, you know, just letting it all out. Actually, 
it does dial down that intensity straight away. So you are releasing because it does stack up in the body, doesn't it? It really does. And it almost completes that whole fight or flight cycle, right? So that you can actually process through your feelings. And I promise it heals you from the inside out because I, I don't carry that same pain anymore. And I think that's why I thank you so much for saying like, I can actually be truly happy in my life. And I never knew that was possible, but it is. And, and it's, it's not quick and it's not fast and it's not easy. It takes work, but it is 100% doable for everyone, regardless of what you're going through. Wow. I mean, that's such an empowering message from you, Carol. And it just really resonates. And I, and I love that. I mean, I know that is totally possible with breakup and divorce, but I didn't know it was possible in your scenario. So thank you so much for sharing. I do think that's quite incredible. Now, you had something that happened to you when you were getting that diagnosis and processing mm -hmm. what was about to happen for you and your gorgeous boy and your husband. Tell us a little bit about what happened, because I know you've gone on and created something quite amazing from that. Yeah. So um, basically, when we were getting our diagnosis, we went to Cleveland Clinic and I thought this was just a routine visit at this point, like a very big intro. And we, we didn't know what we had and we knew it was bad, but I didn't know what that meant. Does that mean he's going to live till 40 or be blind or be in a wheelchair? I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying these things out loud. And I had normalized all of those. Um, at that point, because we knew it was bad and progressive with no cure or no treatment. What we didn't know was how bad and how soon. And so we're going to Cleveland Clinic and we didn't even have like, it wasn't even in a hospital room. It was just an office, a little tiny white office with the doctor who specialized in the thing that we thought TJ may have. And within 20 minutes, I mean, we had had three months of extensive testing before. Within 20 minutes, he looks at us and says, your son's probably not gonna see his second birthday. This is what he has. This is what's going to happen. Bada, bada, bada. And I mean, like, I mean, that was obviously, obviously the toughest news I've ever had in my life. And I was just, I, I, I couldn't, I, I was like out of my head. I couldn't figure out how in a million years I could live through this. I can't, like, I can't, I can't, I can't reject, reject. And I was in the passenger side on the way home from that appointment of our car. And it was like raining and black and dark December 14th. And just like barely breathing, like almost catatonic. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this. So um, like that's, I can't live through it. And I remember at that moment when I was like, surrender, like that's, no, nope, nope. I had this divine flash and it was, I, I just, I know it was divinity coming through me. And it was basically how TJ taught me how to live. It was this, this amazing metaphor. And it was these strong horses, cartoon horses randomly, in a circle, with like just like my family, like the six of my family were there. And I'm holding this little ladybug who's TJ. And somehow I know this in my, this, you know, three second flash. And we're all sobbing because we just learned that TJ is going to live this short life. And the TJ, the ladybug, looks up at me, mama horse, and is like, why are you crying? Like, I'm genuinely confused. What's wrong? And we're like, you're going to live a short, what? You're living a short life is what, you know, I thought. And he was like, but I'm a ladybug. You guys are horses. I only know how to be a ladybug. I don't know how to be a horse. And it was essentially like, I'm not supposed to live your life. I'm not supposed to live till 80. I'm supposed to live this exact life and I'm okay. And it was like, wow. oh my gosh, this is how we're going to get through it. Reframe. Like, how do I ref this? It was given to me. I didn't do it, but that's how I'm going to reframe. So he went from being a sick child. That was like a tragedy to a perfect ladybug where we, we cherished every single minute with him. Now, don't get me wrong. There was all the fear and terror still, but the reframe, and then he became like our whole family and the whole city of Columbus, Ohio's ladybug. We really treated him as a, as this perfect being that he actually was. And we stopped being so human and fearful about it, it helped. And so, wow. if, yeah. So if any of your listeners could kind of take your circumstance in divorce or heartbreak. And, and that's not going to change. And we can't change that. And that's not in our power, but how we view it and reframe it and reshape it in a story that can serve you is a really helpful tool. Wow. Amazing. And, and it's so, so powerful. And when you say it like that, it seems so simple, doesn't it? Yeah. It's so, such a simple way, but actually it feels like it's the truth. It feels like that's the reality. It feels like 
yeah that that and that's such a good coping mechanism as yeah. well to be able to use that in any scenario it's a transferable life skill isn't it for any difficult scenario it really is so now that i've learned it from tj essentially i have just incorporated it in my life over and over like oh it's time for allow release trust i gotta get this shit out of me or it's time for a reframe or right and so you know i made it into this cute little book the gift of the ladybug i mean come on i love it i love it i mean it's amazing that that came to you in the worst moment of your life Right. And then that is now you've turned that into an Amazon best-selling book, not just a uh -huh. book, an Amazon best-selling book. And you are helping people all over the world, as well as other children and their parents, which to me is just you've taken that pain and you've turned it into your superpower. And it's helping so many people all around the world. I mean, Carol, it's amazing. Tell, tell us about that. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. So I ended up um, making it into a book and having it illustrated by this brilliant illustrator, Evie Shelvia, um, two years after TJ passed away and launched it on his birthday, January 28th. And it became an Amazon bestseller on the first day, which was just stunning. And wow. it's become, it's kind of become a national movement in how to um, cope with difficult diagnoses with peace, power, and love because it, and it's really how to live also with differences with p and accept it it's a book about acceptance it's this beautiful metaphor about the two horses who have a ladybug son and the son ladybug son teaches the horses that he's okay and perfect exactly as he is and so it's a really easy metaphor for kids to get say if if their parents have gone through a divorce and they're really struggling like this isn't the life i saw like you're supposed to be a horse right yeah. like you're supposed to stay together and we're supposed to be a family unit well sometimes there's a ladybug thrown in there sometimes you know this was it was actually never supposed to be this family unit but maybe there's an uncoupling or a way we can redefine the new family that serves us all even better and somehow that's going to serve us better we have to just trust that it's possible you know and it's it's the kind of thing yeah so the book's really great for kids but also for parents like it helped me more than anything in my life it's it's like my bible of how to live <laughs> yeah and, and i guess the message there is so powerful that it doesn't matter what's happening. This is your path. This is the path you are meant to be on. It's not supposed to be the fairy tale in your head that you created based on something else that you've seen or a life someone else has lived before you or alongside you. This is your path. And this is all happening for a reason. I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason and it serves a purpose. And even though in those huge moments of, of, of trauma or pain where just life takes a a, a curveball swerve the other direction that you were not looking for you weren't hanging on and you just got flung yeah. across going oh my goodness how do I get back up from this this is meant to be whatever is going on is meant to be and oh, once you said at the beginning you can't control that you can't control those things you can control how you react to it and you can control your actions moving forward and again, like you said, because everything you said is just incredibly spot on, in, in my opinion, that, you know, it, it's not easy. It's, you know, we talk about this and, you know, I talk a lot about it from divorce, being on the floor, doing the ugly crying and then yes. getting up and trying to rebuild my life, realizing that it was a toxic relationship as well. And I didn't see that coming. Yeah. But but working your way up from there, that adversity makes you stronger and you can, like you have, turn that into your superpower. Um, and I know you're working with a, with a big charity now as well, aren't you? Yeah, it's fun. So all the proceeds for the book in one way or the other help children with critical illness. And so right now we're doing um, a special, the National Gift of the Ladybug Day, which is a day to celebrate all kids with critical illness, is on TJ's birthday. It was officially registered last year on January 28th. So exciting. Wow. So, yes, that's amazing. You've got a national day named after this. This is incredible. I mean, gosh. TJ, you know, made I know, TJ. legacy for, for people, you know, for, for forever moving forward. Yeah, it's just TJ did it, right? I mean, amazing. So, uh, but what we can do is a comfort kit, which is the hardcover plus cute little polka dot, you know, this is this is TJ essentially, but his name is polka dot. <laughs> it's a little cuddly toy for those that are listening on the podcast. It's a little cuddly toy. Oh, yeah. Around. Yeah, super cute, super cute. And yeah, the book right. Is beautiful, by the way, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. It looks like a work of art. Oh, thank you so much for that. So we could we have a program where you can give a comfort bundle to directly to kids at Make a Wish Metro New York, 
So, um, and this is going on all year and um, we've done a lot of things for the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation in the past. Right now we're doing Make-A-Wish Metro New York, but also we could do hospitals and, and you know, we're always open to any. Wow. I mean, I am blown away by you. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, we've met a couple of times now and, and every time I meet you, it just, you know, your energy is incredible and your story is so moving. But what you've done with it, Carol, and the way that you've turned that into something that's helping so many people. I mean, you are one incredible woman. Now, for me as well, one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about on this on this podcast is is really about how you recovered as well. Because, you know, I mean, getting yourself back up from there and moving forward. We've talked a little bit about some of those things you do in the moment. But I know that you discovered something else, didn't you? you discovered a whole passion for your for, that has helped you rebuild yourself and also, you know, create, you know, an, an amazing lifestyle. So tell us a little bit about that part of the story too. Sure. Um, so it's basically around food bliss. So my whole life I've been in love with food and had a food passion and, and started a food business in Chicago, got off track a little bit in real estate, went promised myself I'd go all the way back to food always. And um, I'm, it's me food from now on. And um, it was about a year, I'd say after TJ died and I was going to counseling every, grief counseling every week and doing everything I could. And like nothing was moving the needle. I was a mess. I was miserable. I had insomnia. I was nauseous all day. I felt like there was like glass in my blood, right? And I'm sure anyone who's going through a hard time right now with divorce and heartbreak, that's how it feels. It feels just like you're missing arms and limbs. It's horrible. It's actually a physical pain, isn't yes. it? Which is something that I think people don't really realize until it happens. You actually are in, crippled with physical pain, which feels inexplicable because it's an emotional pain. Exactly. And and you don't even think it's possible to be this painful and it is. And it's just, uh. so I was like, okay, uh, this is awful. I'm not living in the promise that I made to myself once I watched TJ. Like I promise I will do my best to live powerfully outside of my circumstances, even after he's gone, that honors him. And I wasn't doing it. I'm like, I'm not living the TJ way. How do I get back to live that way? I don't know. I need something drastic. And I was in the shower. I'll never forget it. And I'm washing my hair, something drastic, pretend I'm not in pain, pretend, pretend I'm not in grief, pretend money doesn't matter. And pretend I have one year left to live. What would I do? And I thought, you know what? I mean, obviously I would go, I, first of all, I would do my, my dream Remember back in that, when I was pregnant, watching the food network, I would start my dream of a food show. So I'd make my first food show on a blog. Let's eight episode, little first food show of my own. I would go to Italy for three months, three months, like long, like I want to live over there and I want to make wine. All of a sudden I got lighter. Well, I'd make wine. Well, I would make cheese. Could I harvest olives? <gasps> And all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's, I've never felt that relief before in a year. Like that's possible. And I was like, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And so my husband and I figured out a way to do it. We launched a blog, Chalk Sizzle Pop, and we were there for three months. And I made my first little eight episode TV show on my blog. And he did wow. the job. And, and we just um, learned and harvested olives and made wine and made cheese and traded our time for um, living over there and working on organic farms. And what was so, I called it my food bliss moment and it moved the needle. It was the first thing that moved the needle in from getting from pain back, you know, back to okay again. And the reason it worked I, upon reflection was because A, it took my something, my passion, it infused my passion and it was something sort of larger than life and it gave me something to plan, to live, and then to have a memory of that was not like my pain. That was not my old everyday life where there was a big void of TJ or say a big void of your husband, you know, that you're now lo no longer with, or that perfect family that you thought you were going to have. Get out of that and do something with your passion and with joy in a larger than life way. It doesn't have to be expensive. We traded our time for like, we literally traded our time for this. And it left me improved. And so I learned that adding joy and passion and following your dreams can actually also pull you out of the pain. And so I called it my food bliss moment. And I said, okay, I promised myself, okay, now I'm going to move to New York and, and work on making, be making shows of food and wine. That's my dream. And I'm going to do food bliss activities, which is like, do these larger than life, like go to Chinatown, find my favorite soup dumplings on the regular in New York so that I can pull myself out. And by infusing food bliss into my life over time, plus the art of acceptance, plus the reframe, I pulled myself out of the pain. And I promised myself once I'm out, I'm going to do this for other people. And I'm going to make a show called Food Bliss 
um, taking people who've experienced tough times and taking them in larger than life food culinary experiences and show them that it's possible to feel joy and happiness again. Wow. So that's what I did this summer. Yeah. And you've done it. Tell us about that. Tell us about the show. Ah! Oh, it was so <laughs> divine. It was like so divinely guided. I can't even stand it. I mean, I had ladybugs landing on me, like right, left and center. It was so cool. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, I, went to Sicily this summer. And I remember meditating before, like, who is my perfect first guest? Like, this is just anyone who's experienced tough times, divorce. Um, I don't know, hurricane cancer survivor. It's, it's not a loss thing. It's just tough times. But for the pilot, I wanted it to be a sort of a thing that was similar to my experience. And I heard the word, like, who should my first guest be Kelly Cervantes? And I was like, I don't really even know Kelly Cervantes. I know that she is married to the guy who plays Miguel Cervantes, who plays Hamilton in New York City on Broadway, like, whoa. I know, and that's, that's uh, actually, I went to see that exact show with you did? Jenny Bacar, who took me, because she had tickets, and she kindly took me when I was in New York. I remember. Obviously, yeah, you know comics, we all went out for lunch that same day, so that night that we met in New York, that's when we went off to uh, to Broadway, and she took me to see Hamilton, so yeah, I saw him, yeah, it was amazing oh show. Gosh, I love her so much, and how great, that that's Miguel Cervantes, right? Yes, he did yeah. that having lost a child three years ago. Can you believe that? Amazing. I mean, he is an incredible performer. I mean, actor, singer. I mean, his musicality, I, it was absolutely unbelievable. And I didn't know until afterwards when I put the pieces together, I was like, oh my goodness, that was the guy who lost his child. And look what he's doing now. So another incredible story. But you, you went to see with his wife, right? Right. So in that meditation, I heard Kelly Cervantes. I'm like, oh, Kelly, Cervantes. of course, they lost their child three years ago to epilepsy. She probably doesn't want to be happy again or know she's happy. That's where I was at three years. Let me check in with her and see if this is something we she would be interested in. And and in, in within a day, she's like, oh, yeah, I'm down. Miguel is down. We're going to do this thing. And and she's like, so we went to Sicily, I took her to Sicily on an all expense paid, you know, trip of four days of food explosion. So like her favorite food was cannolis, which is why we went to Sicily. So we went to like oh, an award-winning female, amazing pastry chef and made cannolis. And we had, wow. we love shrimp. We got shrimp on the Mediterranean, like the, this red shrimp that's famous in Sicily. And then we, she has never been to a vineyard. So I took her to two vineyards, one super like old school, 200 years old, and one brand new modern boutique, hot, awesome. And we had Sicilian, traditional Sicilian barbecue on a vineyard overlooking Mount Etna and drinking their wine with the grapes, like right there. And oh gave her this mind blowing food ex bliss experience, as well as the soulful, you can feel better again, you know, conversations that we were having. And we made the pilot for food bliss and we're in post-production now we're shopping it. It's so exciting. Season one. Oh, wow. Amazing. And congratulations. Um, Cause I mean, what a, what a story. So tell me about this food bliss then. So is it that you're hitting the senses? Because obviously you've got the taste, the smell, you're talking about the beauty around you, you've got the visual, the sounds of the, you know, maybe the barbie. I don't know. Tell me, is that is that why it works so well? Why it's so evocative and powerful? You nailed it right on the head. Yes, that is a huge reason. First of all, if you're a food lover, right, this kind of thing is going to blow your mind. So it's one getting like the heightened senses of the excitement of the thing that like you're doing your passion in a brand new place with all of this, the sensory overload. So you're in a new place. So visually it's stunning, right? We're in Sicily and we're looking at Mount Etna and we're in a vineyard. Visually, the sense is amazing. And then if you're a food lover and you're into food and then you're smelling like barbecue on the, like, like, like sausage that we literally made by hand with a butcher in your note, like while you're looking at the Vista and then you taste it and you're like, Oh my gosh. So it's sense of all of your senses. And then you're listening to like, yeah, music. And it's, I think it's the, it brings you into the, all these senses bring you into the present moment, which can take you out of your pain. It's like, you can't feel joy and pain at the same time. Right. Yeah. So if you infuse joy in a way that for you hits the mark. And so for my food bliss show, it's people that love food. So this thing does it for them. So wow. normally if you would feel good, do something that normally would feel amazing even if you, you don't feel great, but just put in the, put in the joy in a sensory way. And it can like, it can just literally take you out from your pain. Yeah. So anything that you're passionate about can do it. And I'm just thinking when you're talking about that, you know, what do people do when they go through a breakup? Well, 
they definitely don't go out to restaurants and experience food. I mean, more than likely they're sort of scraping around in the bottom of the fridge, they're ordering a delivery, you know, or it's some sort of pre reheat meal, microwave meal, you know, God forbid it's pot noodles, something like that. But it, it that is sort of low down on your priority because you don't feel like eating because you don't want to eat. You don't, you know, so you know, what's your what's your advice for people who are going through that right now? Thinking, well, that sounds good, but it's just oof, no, I'm, I'm not there. Yeah. Oh, it's a really interesting point. I mean, I I was there too. I was either on either spectrum. I didn't want to eat at all and I lost a lot of weight, or I wanted to eat emotionally and like eat stuff that wasn't good for me and make cookies and yeah. just, I don't care. Fuck it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so it, it's using f- for me because food's my lifelong passion. It was using it, looking at it differently, not using it, using it for emotional wellness. Um, and so I, I would say it was very important for me to have a, a very physical, healthy body recovering from grief. And I'd say, this is great for anyone who's been through a divorce or heartbreak. Like you've got to take care of your body in the midst of this because it's everything falls apart but you got to give yourself a fighting chance and what that would be is get stay properly hydrated you know like having 16 ounces of water with a squeeze of lemon first thing in the morning and just just i'm sorry force yourself to do it like i know you don't feel like it you got to give yourself a running chance and then add in nutrients and nourishment and make sure you eat vegetables and like just don't just don't do the like the noodles all the time you've got to get yourself some nutrients and then if food is a passion for you just just maybe reframe it and say like oh i could actually i could take care i could take care of myself it's yeah. a way of like self healing and self love like i could make myself a beautiful meal that sounds really delicious and have time in the kitchen with myself and all of a sudden i'm nourishing myself and like yeah. once you do enough of these these things like you let you release your stuff you add in joy you're your superpower you're your superhero and, it's, yeah. and you are the one pulling yourself out. And I feel like it's that self-trust after this trauma that makes you have the superhero power to live your actual best life. I love that. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah absolutely. It's, it's saying, right, I'm going to push myself out of my comfort zone. Because if you carry yeah. on doing what you're always doing, the old saying, you're going to get the same results. So we have to do something different. So I do agree that maybe just getting, you know, even if you're just going to go get some onions and some spices or, you know, just and just try frying something up and cooking or, you know, boiling the water in a pan and doing it, just doing something, chopping yeah. some vegetables, you know, just keep it simple. You can keep it super simple, but just that activity. And yes. then, you know, like you said, but maybe a glass of wine that you're going to enjoy with the food rather than just having the glass of wine because you want a glass of wine to get you yes. through. It suddenly becomes a whole different experience. And, and like you said, you've got to add that joy back in, that bit of sparkle. I always talk about, you know, where where can we add some sparkle back in? So find that thing you want to do. And maybe even find a friend. This can be Ooh. good. You know? Ooh, you've got love a friend that, that likes the cooking. You've got the friend that likes going to nice restaurants, you know. Find that friend, phone them up and go, I know you like this. <laughs> right, I need some help. Come around and cook for me or take me somewhere. Let's go somewhere. Let's do something. Ooh, so, I love that. Ooh, that's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Friends can make a big difference, right? Oh, they make all the difference, right? Oh, they so help in these times. Really do. Really do. Wow. Well, I mean, gosh, we've covered so much. You are, I mean, you have to be one of the most inspiring women or people that I've ever met, Carol. I really mean that. You really <laughs> are incredible. And, and, you know, I think you've gone through what is my personal biggest fear in life and to see what you've done with that. And not only what you've done, you know, to, for yourself and the memory of TJ and the way you've created these products, but in fact, you're helping so many people now all over the world. You know, it's just a wonderful gift, you know, and a, and a and just an incredible thing to have done. So, you know, I'm just a huge fan, a huge, huge fan. Wow. That is so generous and so kind. And thank you so much. I mean, it goes both ways. You are a shining example as well. Like you can do it. You can get through the, I mean, the hardest possible of divorces and live this powerful, like you are the most empowered, amazing businesswoman. I'm so inspired by you every day and you're just showing everyone it's possible. It's possible. And I think it's about taking our power back. Right. And you just do it so brilliantly. So I love it. I love it. I, and I, I'm hoping people are taking some, you know, I'm sure they will have taken something from this, but you know, you can do it and you can control that yourself. It's not external, it's internal. And no matter what's happening, even in the worst of scenarios, there is a way to navigate through. So Carol, 
first of all, where can people find you? If people want to follow you on Insta, where can they find you? What's your website as well? Okay. On Insta, it's Carol, C-A-R-O-L-E dot Mac, M-A-C. And I'd love to see you there. And it's carolmac.com for my website. Thanks. I'd love to see you. Yeah. Now I have one final question that I ask yeah. all my guests on my podcast. Um, the podcast is called Heartbreak to Happiness. Yeah. And I think it's really important to know what happiness is. And I kind of think you've probably answered this for us during, during the interview, but what is happiness for you, Carol? Oh, what a great question. Happiness for me is living in alignment with like my highest and best self. So For me, that's living like on the bedrock of what TJ taught me, like how to live powerfully. It's living powerfully, meaning control your insert in, let's see, control your like internal circumstances and just choose to be happy, choose to be at peace, choose to be well, and then make your dreams come true and add in a ton of joy and fun. And I love that recipe. I wish we could cook that one up in the kitchen. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That would be fabulous. It really would. Well, thank you so much, Carol. You have been an absolutely fabulous guest. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I can't wait to see you again. And no, I can't wait to. I'm coming out soon, so I'm sure we'll hook up and we'll catch up and hopefully do another podcast in the future. You've been amazing. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. Do head on over to carolmack.com to find out more about Carol and her amazing, inspiring work. And I look forward to you joining me on my next episode. That's it for today's episode of Heartbreak to Happiness. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to win a free ticket to one of Sara's virtual retreats. The retreats are a transformative combination of live webinars with Sara herself, coupled with empowering online video programs designed to help you cope better with your breakup and start feeling happy again. For more details, head on over to heartbreaktohappinesspodcast.com, where you can also get a copy of Sara's free gift. Thank you and join us again on the next episode for another dose of Heartbreak to Happiness.